Hey -o, and what is up gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. Last week NXT on USA debuted and it was booked like a mini takeover. It was absolutely awesome and it was clearly the superior wrestling show as the Wednesday Night War kicked off in full gear last week. This week as we got the second episode of NXT... Not really so much, and we are here to talk about it right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare, and you are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's NXT Review and Reaction Show right here on Sledgehammer TV. Let's do it. <laughs> It's time to bring the hammer down on NXT, and while this show, in my opinion, was really not all that bad, it is definitely something that I was not expecting. And before we go any further, there is one thing that I want you guys to think about, and maybe this show wasn't exactly as bad as some people might be saying. The premiere episode of any show is supposed to be a special event, and it is booked as such when it comes to professional wrestling. And think about that. If from week to week they continue to try to book NXT weekly episodes like mini takeovers, then NXT TakeOver itself is going to suffer, it's going to take a hit, and it will lose everything that makes it special itself. You cannot expect to sustain that kind of momentum and build for every single show to have that big fight, big pay-per-view feel. And it's only going to ruin your pay-per-views as well. And I think that maybe Triple H and company might have realized this. And they stopped, it, it's possible that they stopped worrying about what AEW is doing. It's not that they're not worried about AEW, but they're not going to focus on what they're doing over there and they're just going to be NXT. They're going to take that mindset, you know, we are not your kind. We are going to do what we do here and the fans are going to come. And that's a great mindset to have. It's the same exact frame of mind and the mantra that I try to apply to this show every single time we sit in front of this camera. I'm just going to do what I do, and you're going to love me, or you don't. And then the fans will come. And I think that's a great thing for them to step back and do. If that is the case, I can totally respect that. If that's not the case... And they actually sat back and booked this episode of NXT as a counter to NXT Dynamite. I'm sorry, as a counter to AEW's Dynamite from last week. Then they kind of blew it. So let me explain that a little further as well. If you have been an NXT fan for an extended period of time, like myself, you probably enjoyed this episode for what it is. But new viewers... People that are tuning in for the first time, they may not have had as good of a time as you and I did because they did not experience it the same way. They're not as familiar with the talent. They don't really know how NXT operates and they might have been put off by a show like this following such a heavy and loaded and stacked show to kick things off. And this was not what I expected for a follow-up to that, which is why I have to believe that they just took the frame of mind of, screw it, we're just going to do what we do, and, and we're not going to care. We're not going to make these big grandiose cards. We're just going to be NXT. We're going to do what we do. Fans of NXT will even admit, and you have to know, that in its one-hour WWE Network format, the show was not always a five-star spectacular. And... Very so often, usually after a takeover, there's usually like a lull in the NXT show. Like for a couple of weeks, it just it just kind of checks out. It takes like a vacation. It just gives you like a couple of cool matches. The wrestling quality is always great. But there's not really anything to latch on to. And they're just kind of maybe planting seeds of, of things that are to come, which I do appreciate. But you know what I'm talking about. They're just not really special shows. They're just there. And I think that this was one of those shows. The action on this night 
was outstanding. We had a couple of things that I really did like. I really did like some things on this show as well. It's not all bad. Not like it is when we watch Monday Night Raw, right? Some of the things I liked on this show, before we start bringing the hammer down and getting all negative, the exchanging of pre-recorded promos. Man, that is a lost art, and that is something that they have to bring back to all wrestling shows. Having the two people that are going to be fighting each other, talking trash, getting under each other's skin, pre-recorded comments weeks before or one week before their big matchup, getting everybody hyped, getting them self-hyped, trying to get in their opponent's head. You got to dig that. That's classic pro wrestling. That's a, a very basic building block of any program that you're seeing. So it was great to see that. They had them for two matchups throughout the night. We had Keith Lee and Donovan Dijakovic. They were shooting bobs at each other. And then we also seen uh, Damian Priest and Pete Dunne. Promotional packages hyping their matchup for next week. And now you're excited for next week because this is the type of thing you need to do on a show like this, which really didn't have much going for it other than Walter versus Kushida which is one of the other things I absolutely loved on this night, with the exception of the finish. We'll talk about that. I also really enjoyed the fact that the Cruiserweight title is now property of the NXT brand. It is the NXT Cruiserweight Championship, and the Cruiserweight title match to kick off this episode really had me thinking that this was going to be another one of those really big, fun, over-the-top episodes for NXT because we started with a great Cruiserweight Championship match. We have a new Cruiserweight Champion. He's going to be a great champion, and it's going going to be fun to have Leo Rush in this role that he's in. He's going to we we hit the reset button hard on Leo Rush. He's not going to be the lapdog of Bobby Lashley the Milk Dud anymore. And Leo Rush is going out there, he's winning gold. Big night for House of Glory guys all across the board. Leo Rush another person from House of Glory. He's a former House of Glory uh, crown jewel champion. Awesome. And I love seeing guys that I know and, and coming up in the indies making it big. And he had a little bit of a rough patch, but apparently he did some hip-hop songs. He did some rap songs and stuff, and everybody loves those. And now that he's they getting a nice big push. And I really did enjoy the Cruiserweight Championship. Rhea Ripley, the Nightmare. And I'm pretty sure some of you guys that were watching this that are already fans of this show were thinking about this guy and going, Oh, man, Nick's probably not going to like this. And you know what? Initially... I, I almost didn't, but the fact is that I love Rhea Ripley. I think she's fantastic. I love her look. She looks like Pete Dunne's little sister. She's a badass. She's all, like, hard rock. She don't take no shit. She's a big, powerful girl. She's awesome. She's awesome. She's got my official endorsement to use the Nightmare as her moniker. Usually I would hate it and I would shit all over the person, but I'm going to give her a pass because Rhea Ripley is awesome. If anybody could represent the Nightmare moniker, then I'm happy that it's her and not one of these other jabronis on the roster disrespecting such a cool nickname. But I'm with it. I'm absolutely with it. But now, aside from those things... And the commentary, as always, is, is pretty, pretty good. But tonight I feel like they got a little bit annoying because they were very, very repetitive, especially in the case with Roderick Strong. Like, how many times can you say the word backbreaker in one match? Even when the guy uses it for every other move, it's only making it repetitive and kind of boring and just like, oh, again with the backbreaker. But still, not really much negative to say about the dynamic between Mauro Ronaldo, Nigel McGuinness, Beth Phoenix, probably the best three-person team going today in all of wrestling calling the action. So I also really did enjoy that for the most part. But for the things that I didn't like, like I was talking about, I didn't like the finish of Kushida versus Walter. This was a fucking excellent match. This is my kind of match. This is the type of wrestling I enjoy. You have a dichotomy between the two. They are not too similar. They are absolute opposite ends of the spectrum. Styles make matches, man. And you had no two different styles than you could have ever come across than Walter and Kushida. It was a great, great matchup, but I did not like the finish. It was a little bit underwhelming to me after everything that they had went through for Kushida to just go down to a simple ripcord clothesline. I, I just didn't... 
they should have ended it on the power bomb. Like that just should have been it. That was so impactful and such a powerful moment. And then Kushida kicks out of that. And you feel like this match is going to keep going, but there's only like two minutes left in the show. And it just finished a little bit underwhelming is the best word to use it. Otherwise it was a fantastic main event. Probably didn't mean much to anybody tuning in for the first time. They're probably wondering why this little Japanese Marty McFly is fighting the giant Biff Tannen from Germany. <laughs> it's a very strong Back to the Future vibe. And it's weird because I was thinking it in my head and then Mauro Ronaldo actually said Back to the Future for some reason. I think Beth Phoenix made some kind of a weird comment. And he just has, Kushida has this weird vibe where he looks like he came straight out of Back to the Future too, Like that scene where they're all hoverboarding over the town square, you know, like. Looks like he's one of Biff's goons. <laughs> but I, I enjoyed everything about that except for the finish. I also didn't enjoy Brizongo being jobbed out to the Forgotten Sons. The Forgotten Sons. Sanity 2.0. They remind me of Sanity, just much more generic. And minus the gigantic muscle man enforcer and the cool crazy chick. When you take those two elements out... And you just got another three-man stable. And these three guys, like, I get it, the Forgotten Sons, you know, they're ex-members of former tag teams coming together to try not to be forgotten. And you got Jackson Ryder on the outside. And maybe it needs a little bit more time. They've been around for a while, but there's just something about them that just seem generic to me. Just very plain. And I, I'm not seeing... I guess what everybody else is seeing with the potential here. But, I mean, it's nothing about their talent. The match was entertaining. It just, I I don't get it. And I don't get why Brizongo is bringing their Monday Night Raw slash SmackDown Live clown show with them back to NXT. I thought they were going to take themselves a little bit more seriously. The reboot not really going the way I would have liked to have seen. I wanted to see them come back and show the world just how friggin' good they really are, and they didn't get a chance to really do so in this segment that they were given against the Forgotten Sons. I absolutely hated the Cameron Grimes match. Now, I talked about Cameron Grimes before on this channel. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. The guy looks like he's smaller than Daniel Bryan, and he's beating people bigger than him with one double stomp maneuver. First of all, how do you not get out of the way of the double stomp when you're 100% fresh, Boa? I feel bad for Boa. I don't really want to come down on poor Boa, but you might as well just read this guy his rights. He is dead. He is dead. The first time you have exposed him to us and he comes out there to fight this Cameron Grimes guy, he's got the height advantage, he's got the reach, you can clearly see this guy's an athlete, he is from uh, Japan, I believe, or from China, I forgot which which area of the, country, of the world they said that, or which country he comes from, but in any case, the kid looked impressive, he had a, a cool name, Bola, he had like a, like a snake head logo thing, and I was like, alright, here's somebody new we can get into, and then they introduced fucking Cameron Grimes, and I'm not feeling Cameron Grimes, and then he goes off and, and beats this Boa kid in three seconds, just send Boa away, that's it, thank you for coming kid, because now we can do nothing with you, how are you supposed to come back from that, you're supposed to come back from getting beaten in 30 seconds with one move, you didn't get one piece of offense off, and what's so special about this Cameron Grimes kid? A standing double stomp? That's enough to put you out? I, I don't get it. I, I absolutely hate it. They need to do something more with him before he just becomes the most, the thing I despise most on this on this show. Because it, it's already reaching that. I need explanation. I need more. Before I really give my judgment on a Cameron Grimes. I hated it, man. Not the best night for Mike Work. The Velveteen Dream and Adam Cole were terrible on the microphone tonight. And then you had Tommaso Ciampa making his triumphant return once again. He goes into the ring and says three words. Then he goes to the back, gets into an altercation with Angel Garza, and says four more words. And that was about it. This show kind of dragged on despite the good action throughout the majority of the night. But NXT Live 
from Full Sail University, which needed to wake up, by the way. They were there for certain moments, but there was something really off about this crowd. It's almost like they were given a half a Xanax as they walked into the arena, and they like were phasing in and out. I don't know. It was it was weird. The usual full cell crowd is nonstop from from start to finish. Maybe it was the card, or maybe it was just the crowd. Maybe everybody's experiencing just a little bit of wrestling exhaustion because I know I'm already starting to feel it. It's on such a constant and steady stream that I'm starting to rethink my fandom in some cases because I'm starting to feel like we're all going a little bit crazy with wrestling and everybody's so defensive. It's ridiculous. No room for criticism. Nobody can stand anybody's opinions. Bunch of millennials. Ridiculous. Anyway. (laughs) Match number one. The NXT Cruiserweight title match. Like I said, Leo Rush no longer. Lashley's lapdog. Former House of Glory Crown Jewel champion versus Drew Gulak, the now former champion. Drew Gulak had a pretty good run. He's a very entertaining guy. He's absolutely talented in the ring. But the move of the championship around the waist to Leo Rush is going to prove to be a good thing. He is now the NXT Cruiserweight Champion. Drew Gulak gives him a show of respect after the match. He's given the title by William Regal. They made a whole big thing out of it. And hopefully they don't drop it and they they get Leo Rush going where he needs to be. Because the guy is really great. And you got a taste of that. Just a taste of how good he is. In this match. I know firsthand. I have seen him in the ring. With some of the best. I have seen Leo Rush. Versus Ricochet. In the middle of a House of Glory ring. I'm telling you guys. It was something special to behold. You guys need to not to sleep on Leo Rush. Don't let what they did to him on Monday Night Raw. Sour him for you. If that's the case. Be a little bit open minded. Because this might be one of the better things about NXT. From this moment on. We had a segment hyping Finn Balor's return. They showed some of the highlights of his NXT career, his 292-day championship reign on top of the gold brand. And I liked this, man, hyping things up. Not just having them there, having random matches. I like it. You need to do more of this. Doing it twice in one show for the same guy? Maybe that's overkill. Maybe it's a little bit filler because they didn't really have a lot to put on this show. But, uh... I enjoyed it. I liked that segment a lot. We had a promo for the return of Tegan Knox. Tegan Knox returning to the NXT Women's Division next week. She was very impressive in the Mae Young Classic. She's going to look to make her name outside of that and make that not be the last thing the WWE Universe remembers of her. And it'll be interesting to see where they put her. I I was impressed with her. I just not sure where exactly she's going to fit in with the current crop of talent. I know NXT initially had huge, huge plans for Tegan, so don't be surprised if she's immediately inserted at the upper end of the women's division. Maybe we'll start to see her with Candice LeRae, fighting Candice LeRae, or any of the females that are really up the top of the game at NXT, Bianca Belair. Io Shirai, these are some of the people we can be looking forward to seeing Tegan Knox wrestle. How soon? We don't know. Another person you might want to see her wrestle is the Nightmare, Rhea Ripley, who has taken on Aaliyah with Vanessa Bourne. I like this pairing. I like these two. They are very beautiful girls. They got a great look together, and they can be something special, but they won't be able to be something special if all they are going to continue to do is be offered up as jobbers to some of the upper echelon girls, much like Rhea Ripley, the first NXT UK Women's Champion, coming to the standard NXT brand on this side of the pond to prove her dominance as well. She has she got a very quick, very dominant win over Aaliyah. Really nothing much to talk about as far as the match is concerned. But Ripley calls out Shayna Baszler. She wants a shot at the title. And Ripley versus Baszler one-on-one will be friggin' amazing. Rhea Ripley is a beast. Shayna Baszler, we all know, is the most terrifying woman walking the earth today. And I would love nothing more than to see that match as soon as possible. We have a third match on this night was the Brizongo coming out dressed up like construction workers, mimicking the village people, I guess. They had a couple of strippers standing out there, but they were dressed in hard hats and construction gear, and then they had this very weird Titantron that was all... Con- like, are they the construction guys now? 
They're not the fashion police. They're the, I don't know, the fashion developers. Like, I don't know. But I don't know. They're just Brizongo. They're coming out dressed like this. Are they going to come out dressed like Indians next week? Are they going to come out dressed like cops anymore? Like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this nonsense on NXT? They almost deserve what they got coming to them. No, I don't mean that. I'm just trying to be funny. I hated everything about this segment. Brizongo was supposed to be fighting a tag team known as Everrise, but Everrise would be drug out to the entrance ramp both of them were, were being drugged by Jackson Ryder. One man had a tag team. One guy on his shoulder, one guy by the foot, just dragging him out there, making a statement, telling Brizongo, these ain't the guys you're going to fight. You're going to fight my boys, the Forgotten Sons. And the mood in the arena immediately shifted. Everybody was kind of having a good time and laughing and joking around with the construction Brizongo thing. And then this happened and, and there was almost an immediate hush in the crowd. And everybody was like, oh. And this is not what I hoped to see for Brizongo. The Forgotten Sons wiped the floor with them, man. They, they barely gave them a chance to get going. And like I said, they feel like a... a a different, less impressive version of Sanity. Fandango and Breezy, they need to get some wins, man. I thought they were really going to be reborn here, but let's hope that this does not become the norm. I don't want to see them go from being jobbers on Raw and SmackDown to just coming down here to job out on NXT. That's not the point of them coming home, but hope we'll have to hope for the best in that scenario there. Another one of the promos I was talking about, Keith Lee hypes the rematch with D Donovan Dijakovic, the rubber match. Each one of these gigantic superhuman males has a win over the other, and we are going to settle it, probably not once and for all, but we are going to settle it next week on NXT, already shaping up to be a bigger card than what we are currently watching, so they're doing a good job in promoting next week, but if you have people tuning out this week, I don't know how good... The turnout next week is actually going to be. Keith Lee says that he is hungrier, he is more powerful, and he wants it more than Dijakovic. And next week we are all going to bask in the glory of Keith Lee. I love Keith Lee. I think he's friggin' great. You don't often see a big guy that can move the way he moves. He's, he's an inspiration to me. Just I'm I'm a big fan of of guys that can really go at his size. You know, guys like Bam Bam Bigelow that were able to do cartwheels and crazy shit in the ring. Not just the big lumbering oafs like Bundy and John Studd, but guys like Bam Bam that could really go out there and do some stuff. Yokozuna was 600 pounds dropping leg drops. Big Van Vader, Vader bombing people. Keith Lee reminds me of guys cut from that cloth, and I love that style of wrestler, and he's fantastic. I would strap a, a rocket right to his back right now and shoot him right to the top, man. He, he's just really, really very impressive to me, and his work with Dijakovic speaks for itself. These guys shouldn't be pulling off cruiserweight maneuvers. They're both nearly seven feet tall, easily six plus, 300 plus pounds each, flying through the air like Rey Mysterio. Ridiculous. A lot less graceful and ridiculous in a good way. You just can't can't believe your eyes. It, it, it's, it's, it's hard to watch sometimes and it's uncomfortable for me because I'm afraid for these guys' health because really they shouldn't be doing it, which is something I tell you guys on, on a regular basis. But you can't knock physical talent and, and that type of a feat. It's just impressive, man. At that size, you can't knock these guys. Boa! Versus Cameron Grimes. Let's talk about this one more time. One move. A one move match. Standing double stomp. Squash finish. Boa loses. Killian Dane then comes out post match. He doesn't attack Cameron Grimes. Which is what I think everybody was assuming. He attacks poor Boa. And I'm like didn't this guy get embarrassed enough? And even if he decides to come back. And want to get vengeance on Killian Dane. What is to be afraid of Boa? Who's he going to be afraid of Boa? Killian Dane, you think he's going to give a shit? This guy just lost to this little runt guy that looks like a possum in a top hat with a double stomp. He's going to be scared? I wouldn't be scared. Boa is dead. It's a shame. 
Damian Priest had his promo hyping his match with Pete Dunne. Again, much like in Keith Lee's case, I'm a huge fan of Damian Priest. He's my style of a wrestler. He skirts on the dark side. He does the whole flaming letters entrance, pulling back the arrow and the whole thing. I, I love the presentation. The guy's got a great look. He's going to be special if they don't ruin it. I also am a huge fan of Pete Dunne and putting these two guys against each other is is tough for me to pick a winner because I'm really, really such a huge mark for, for both of these guys. It's going to be a special match. This is going to be a ballet of brutality. I cannot wait for this one, and we won't have to wait long as it's going to happen for the first time next week. Damian Priest says Pete Dunne's name was just a bullseye for him, and he is trying to live in infamy, and the archer of infamy will live forever at the expense of Pete Dunne. Great promo, great package, great superstar. Can't wait to see what comes next. Unfortunately, on this episode of NXT, what comes next is another Roderick Strong match. I don't know why Roderick Strong has suddenly become like the most important member of the Undisputed Era. I, I don't get it. He won the North American Championship, fine, but why is he like the only one that we are consistently seeing perform in the ring? I don't know. This night, he goes up against Isaiah Swerve Scott formerly known as Shane Strickland, another person I'm familiar with over my last couple of years in House of Glory. Could they say the word backbreaker anymore in this match? It was really getting to me. <laughs> but this match was very good. This match was good. And if they put Roderick Strong in there because he keeps delivering with decent matches like this one, if he could just scale back on how many times he executes the backbreaker, then maybe it'll be more impressive. You're calling yourself, what What were they calling him? Now I forget, the, the master of the backbreaker or the maestro of the backbreaker, whatever it was. They said it a million times and I'm trying to block it out of my memory. But if you are executing a move and you need to hit it that many times in one match, then you're really not that good at hitting that move, bro. And maybe you should pick something else in your arsenal because the backbreaker is not getting the job done. You shouldn't have to. Imagine if Stone Cold had to hit the stunner 12 times times in order for it to finally take effect and they make a big deal about oh the stone cold stunner oh Roderick strong's backbreaker there it is boom backbreaker and again backbreaker 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 oh look at the master of the backbreaker come on man <laughs> ridiculous this match started off very technical, but the pace picked up very quickly. It became a hard-hitting, striking affair. The Undisputed, of course, came out to help their buddy Strong, and he would win off the distraction. Roderick Strong gets a victory and defends his North American Championship, which led to a very long, very awkward promo segment by Adam Cole. Just very special. Basey with his words, almost as if he was unsure of what he was out there to even say. He was talking some shit, and then he was interrupted by the Velveteen Dream, who delivered his promo much in the same way that Adam Cole delivered his promo. And we had two bad promos happening simultaneously on live TV with the two Two of the top names in the business. One of them being the champion. The other one being its main drawing attraction. And both of them failed big time to get anything going on the microphone tonight. Absolutely blah. Nothing to it. All for the Velveteen Dream to challenge Roderick Strong for a rematch for his North American Championship. You're standing there with the NXT World Heavyweight Champion in the ring. Why not throw your name in the hat for that? Why are you taking step backwards, bro? You had that belt. Go for the big one. Everyone else is gunning for it. Why don't the Dream one in? It was just felt a little forced. Felt like a little much. And then the naked picture of Roderick Strong with the shrunk package all blurred out. and the th Very, very main roster. Very main roster. Didn't need it. Didn't need it. This would all, was not finished, though, because then we had Tommaso Ciampa come out. He gets in the ring. He sits on a chair. He says, Goldie, daddy's home. Daddy's home. That's his his 
big comeback or daddy's home. Tommaso Ciampa. <sighs> then he goes to the back after he says daddy's home. The undisputed, you know, run away all scared because daddy's home. They're going to get punished for being out after midnight, I guess. Bunch of young bastards. <laughs> Kathy Kelly's in the back. She's looking for Tommaso Ciampa, but she gets uh, ambushed by Garza, Angel Garza, who ends up having an altercation with Tommaso Ciampa. He says something to him in Spanish. Ciampa knocks out Garza and then says he has no idea what he just said to him. The sixth match on this night, Dakota Kai versus Bianca Belair. Very good match for both ladies. Dakota Kai looked great in this matchup. Not really a huge fan of her character. I think she needs to come up with something to make her stand out a little bit more from the pack. Right now, she looks like Bailey before Bailey knew what to do with herself in NXT. Just kind of plain. I know she's got the whole team kick thing going, but she just needs something to make her pop. Dakota Kai doesn't pop off the screen like a lot of the other girls. Like, you can't tell me you put them side by side. Bianca Belair pops off your screen. Dakota Kai is just kind of there. And that's not an insult. It's just something she needs to work on and something that she will get to as far as character development is concerned. But in the ring, Bell to Bell, one of the best females that NXT has right now. This was a predictable matchup because you know going in that Bianca Belair is going to win this match. But I expected her to win it with the greatest of ease, but that was not the case. This was an excellent matchup. They gave it a nice amount of time, and it was a good showcase for both of these girls. Nice women's action going on tonight. Not like that earlier squash match. This was an actual legitimate matchup between two talented females. And Bianca Belair gets the win, much like many of us knew was going to happen. What we didn't know was going to happen was that Dakota Kai was going to end up shining off the screen. She doesn't pop off the screen, but she definitely shined a little brighter than some of the other girls that perform on a regular basis on NXT. Definitely worthy of maybe a little bit more of a push. She's just got to work on that character. Bianca Belair hits the KOD for the 1, 2, 3, and then the EST of NXT. There's a lot of letters and numbers there. Put her name in the hat for a shot at Baszler's woman's title. So now we have Rhea Ripley Bianca Belair, both looking for the champ. Triple threat? I'll take that one, too. We had them promoting the w- this WWE press conference happening tomorrow afternoon, which is going to feature Braun Strowman and Tyson Fury and, and Brock Lesnar and Cain Velasquez and all of the people that all week long we have told you we don't want to fucking see at all. So having to use their USA TV time to promote this bullshit, you know, WWE.com event or streaming event was just like, oh, really, you bastards, get off my screen right now. Don't be showing me Tyson Fury and Cain Velasquez when I'm trying to enjoy me some NXT, you bastards. After this, we had a, a the counter promo, the response from Donovan Dijakovic to Keith Lee. This was another very good promo. We followed this with another Finn Balor promo, highlighting this time his road to the Universal Championship. And that how suddenly he ended up back in the ring, face to face with Adam Cole. Then we got Pete Dunne's promo. This was a succession of promos on Damian Priest talking about the Archer of Infamy will not be able to shoot his little arrows with broken fingers, which we all know is Pete Dunne's thing. I'm not a huge fan of it, but it definitely seems apropos in this moment, given the <laughs> his opponent likes to do that little arrow thing with his fingers. The seventh match on this night and your main event of the evening, Kushida versus NXT UK champion or WWE United Kingdom champion as he was announced tonight Walter like I said earlier joking around but it, it's actually pretty serious if you go back and watch it looked like a Japanese Marty McFly versus Biff Tannen from Germany and it was it was a war and that's where all the jokes stop because this match was an absolute war like this is how I like my wrestling it was a battle of wills a test of endurance, especially for the smaller man. 
it was great, man. It was a really good matchup. Styles, the differences in styles is what makes matches like this so special. These two warriors just really went out there. Kushida is one tough son of a bitch to stand in there and take the beating he took from Walter in this matchup. If you didn't have any respect and you did not ever see Kushida before after this night, you should want to see him again. I feel like they did him a little dirty because you had Walter and Kushida. Both coming into this match with undefeated records. As Mauro was saying, the somebody's O has got to go. And I don't think that was necessarily the case. Especially when you take into account that Walter has the Imperium at his side. I think this was the spot to use the run-in, the stable thing. We didn't need all that nonsense with the Undisputed earlier. This was the spot for that so that you could have protected both of these men's undefeated streak by having the match end in a no contest due to the interference by the Imperium because Kushida just would not die. That would make sense. That would be something to make you want to see it more. But now you had Walter pin Kushida ending his undefeated streak in a very underwhelming, unceremonious fashion before it even actually got started. And I don't get that. I don't get that. So that's something I would definitely, definitely have taken out from the script tonight and would have worked on to make it a little bit better. I mean, a ripcord clothesline is a standard move. Even after a, a near 20-minute match and a beatdown, a ripcord lariat shouldn't be the finishing portion of the match. It shouldn't be the finishing move of the match unless your name is Stan the Lariat Hansen. This is the second time this week I have mentioned Stan Hansen on this channel. Isn't, isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? No, probably not, because we're talking about wrestling. <laughs> and it's deep-rooted history, and, you know, everything has happened before. Nothing truly is original. But NXT, on the average, usually is. But tonight, they gave us your regular old NXT. Take it or leave it. That's what I think they did. And we went up and down the card. It was... A fairly decent show. Nothing wrong with the action. A lot of good wrestling on this night. And I like the promotional packages. I like that they are pointed in a direction. And that we are going down a linear path. With most of the stuff going on in NXT. And I can appreciate that. I can appreciate that. I'm just a little bit concerned. That they didn't really give us anything on this show. That has mass appeal. And when you're just getting started, I guess that might be hard to ask for. But following last week's show, if you put them side by side, NXT versus NXT, week one versus week two, if you said week two was better, you'd be an idiot. I don't like to call you guys names, but that would have to be a fact. Because this was a one-match show. Sure, we had a good match for the Cruiserweight Championship. Sure, we had a good match in the women's division. We had a decent tag team matchup, a couple of decent singles matchups. But last week was really good. Really, really big. Really special. As a premiere should be. We'll have to wait and see what else comes from this. Thank you guys for tuning in to our NXT review tonight. Don't forget to leave your comments down in the comments section. Use the hammer emoji and let your hammers fly. Let me know what you guys didn't like about tonight's episode of NXT. Don't forget to be here tomorrow night as we bring the hammer down on SmackDown Live or later this evening, depending on when you're viewing this particular video and also be with us Saturday night as we are going to do the head-to-head -head comparison show AEW versus NXT the Wednesday Night War week two everything wrong you know where to come to find it right here on Sledgehammer TV my name is Nick Nightmare this is the team Thor the Sledgehammer the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show his tag team partner the World Heavyweight Champion of all the microphones in all the world, Mr. Baloo the Snowball, the most important member of the team, as always, is each and every one of you. I want to thank you all once again this week for getting us over the hump of 2,000.
thousand subscribers and now it's to infinity and beyond man i could say let's get to 300 i could say i'm 3000 right i could say let's get to 3k i could say let's get to 5k i really want to get to 10k 100k just like everybody else doing this thing but i will take 2k and be so happy with it and i cannot thank my family of sledgeheads enough if you want to join in on the fun and become a member of the newest coolest family that has taken over the wrestling community one subscriber at a time all you got to do is hit that subscribe button right now hit the notification bell so that you don't miss a thing as we are on this wrestling train that seemingly never stops here at the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. Don't forget to smash that like button if you enjoyed anything we had to say or do here today. Share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, especially if they maybe were a little bit disappointed with NXT and you could tell them this guy is going to make you feel better. He's going to explain to you where we might be headed and I think you might be all right with it and you could send them right here and encourage them to subscribe as well. Don't forget to watch everything else on this channel. We have reviewed everything that has happened all week long. So you got AEW, you got Monday Night Raw, you have, um, you have Hell in a Cell up there. Everything that has been coming at us gets hammered. And you know where to find it. Don't forget to leave your hammers down in the comment section below. That, my friends, is going to do it. And we are out of here. And we will see you tomorrow night for SmackDown Live right here on your new favorite wrestling show, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube.com. Boom.